And that's kind of what you have to get to that deflated, wrinkled skin look at some point. But at that point, your metabolism's high, your nutrient uh, partitioning sky high, your gastric entering rate, emptying rate sky high. So if you start feeding that, you know, and blowing up the blue and you can thin the skin out, metabolism keeps growing with it. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear with coaches Skip Hill, Andrew Berry, myself, Scott McNally, and we are joined by Justin Harris. What's up, man? Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be on. It's been a long time coming. All of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK over there for additional savings on high-quality third-party tested supplements. We are brought to you by supplementsource.ca for Canadians. They have great deals that change week to week. And we're brought to you by you, the people of Patreon. So load us up with questions for the next episode over at Patreon, as well as here on YouTube. And uh, Justin, we've got so much stuff we've wanted to talk to you about. But uh, it's funny because Andrew and I were both on the exact same wavelength. We want to we want to kind of like fanboy and talk about Project Super Heavyweight. So mm-hmm. first of all, we might even have some listeners who don't even know what that is. You might not be born when it came out. Yeah. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Project Super Heavyweight was back when DVDs were new. <laughs> the DVDs right? were even not only were they a thing, but they were relatively new. I was trained with Steve Kuklo, and you know. There were just the forums. There wasn't all this social media and this like media push where everyone was a media expert. And so I, I, I re, you know, I think Jay Cutler was coming out with some DVDs and Mitsuru Okabe was doing the Battle for Olympias and, and I wanted to do one. So I started looking into uh, like, you know, filming one and you talk to a couple of filmmakers and you realize, oh, Christ, I cannot afford that you know see have you ever heard the joke where like uh god says to adam he's gonna give uh, give him a woman and she's gonna love him and care for him and take care of him and cook for him and clean for him and all that he has to give up is you know two knuckles a couple ribs one foot and, and an arm and adam pauses for a second and goes what can i get for one rib <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what i had to do so i was like i had to break it down and i was like well, what can I get for for 36 hours or 72 hours? And that's all I could afford. So this guy, Stu McDonald, who I don't think is even making films anymore, all we could afford was like, it was like Friday night, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. And and uh, and we wanted to film two weeks of workouts. So that's what we did. <laughs> two weeks of DC workouts. Oh, that. man. Yeah. And, and, and we did like a nutrition section at the end. And my whole body started seizing up, <laughs> cramping up after it. Because we did... I mean, it was it was absolute the stupidest thing ever. We bought brought change of clothes so we could change after the first workout and make it look like a new workout. And uh, so I think like the the leg workout was you know we warmed up and then it was like six oh five for eight or something on squat and then like five sixty five for twelve and then four oh five for twenty. And then, you know, we did stiff leg, leg curls, leg extension, calves, all the deep stretching, which is the worst part of all of it. And then we went in the bathroom and changed clothes and came out and did 495 for 10 front squats, 405 for 20 front squats. Oh, my God. All over again. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, we did the same thing with, you know, push and then back. And so the very final day, I don't think we were able to complete two back workouts because we did. We came in that third day, which is, you know, it was like Friday night and then back Saturday morning and then back again Sunday morning. So we're. And week two of workouts, literally 36 hours later, and we were doing deadlifts. And I think, uh, you know, at the time I could pull like 675 for five, six or seven. And I think we did do 675 and I think I got four reps and like blood started squirting yeah. on my forehead, <laughs> and, like through my, <laughs> through my forehead. And like everything just hurt so bad. I couldn't, I think my pee was black. I guarantee you I was in bad <laughs> dog. Probably yeah, a yeah, renal yeah. failure. And uh, and I think we called it on that. We decided not to do the second uh, second back workout, but it was brutal. But it, I mean, it played well. I mean, it basically built my career. It was like what everyone eventually knew me from, and it, so it was worth it once I finally recovered. But uh, yeah, we did, but we after that last workout, we went back to my house to film a nutrition segment, and uh, and I got in the middle of one word. I remember, and then I just like if you remember Paul Delette from like the '93 Arnold when he seized up. Yeah, that's yeah. my body. My body did it. Just everything locked up without the Lasix. Yeah, yeah. Just this was just from overtraining, and yeah, you know, it was torture. And you know, and so my quads are cramping, my hands are cramping, my abs are cramping, my chest is cramping. And like, <laughs> where do you, which one? Because whatever one you stretch out just causes the opposite muscle to contract yeah. and cramp yeah. even more. 
and he shut the video. He showed some of the cramping, I think, on the video, but it was <laughs> it was brutal. But we had no money, you know. It's all, it's all we could do. It was it was like do that or nothing. When you're, you know, I was like 24, so you know you're as near to invincible as you're ever going to be at that age. And Steve was like 19. Steve was like 19. <laughs> He was such such an enigma. You, it, it, you can't say the word our strength anymore, but uh, that's yeah. what I kind of <laughs> used to joke with him because he didn't know any better. He was just a kid. <laughs> so he'd come in like day three where I'm like wondering how I'm going to survive this. You know, I'm like eating Advil and, you know, like praying to who, like every guy I could think of to not not die in the work. He comes in with his hair all frosted tips and done yeah. and <laughs> smiling. <laughs> But yeah, it was, I mean, that was wild. And we, I still get more comments on that than probably anything I've ever done. And it, that was 2006, I think. No kidding. Yeah, that so was let wild, let me ask man. you, did you beat the logbook? That day? Uh, <laughs> the first workout, the, the first squat, squat workout was killer. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think 605 for eight, the, like the 565 for 12 was a really good set. Uh, the 405 for 20, we were doing that all the time. Yep. That wasn't bad. But front squats actually were still held up pretty well. I think I did 495 for 10, which I think was around a PR. Um, and then by but by back, back wasn't that bad. I think I got four with 675, which was only a couple reps short. I mean, it, we really pulled it off. I I ate so much. I remember I was I I, I remember because I used to eat a lot anyways i by at that point i had my metabolism just outrageously high and and so on my high days i think i ate nine meals i would alternate Jeez. a whole food meal and a and a carb protein powder drink so every hour and a half but i remember i ate 11 meals and i think each of my meals were six ounces of meat and two cups of rice so basically roughly 50 grams of protein and 100 grams of carbs and i did 11 of those across <laughs> the day plus an intra workout which was like really new at the time uh, yeah. And which is a funny story, actually, also is talking about Dante and DC training because we were testing the first uh, Waxy Maze. And I've mm -hmm. told this story before, but we he gave us like 14 samples or something. And there was this one sample that was weird because we drank it and it was like your skin turned like dry instantly. And it got like goosebumps. Huh. And I was like, wow, this would be a, but it tasted worse than battery i never drank battery acid but i know i could drink it because i drank this stuff <laughs> and it was it was so bad you immediately developed an aversion to it you could get the first one down we yeah. tried to drink it again the next day and you couldn't do it it was like huh. you see those videos where those guys from like finland eat that one rotten fish canned fish thing as soon as yeah. they open it they'll start getting well so dante called the company and he was like yeah you know this you know sample 11 uh really worked well for what we want just the taste was terrible. And he said the person, uh, like he was talking to, he said, taste? And he's like, yeah, it's disgusting. The taste is, it, you can't even get it down the second time. And the guy was like all confused. He just kept saying, taste, taste. And Dante's like, yeah, it tastes disgusting. There's nothing we can add to it. And the guy goes, uh, that's a filler for wood glue. <laughs> <laughs> oh man not made for so human that, consumption that, that, yeah that Amazing. dehydration was probably our kidneys like yeah failing shutting down <laughs> yeah. so if that was 2006 i saw steve kuklo i believe it was 2006 at the motor city i think it was called the motor city classic yep. in dearborn michigan so were you training with him at that time yeah and that was my favorite show of his because he had won two team nationals natural yeah. And no one believed it, you know, because he was like 205 pounds and no one would believe it. And so I was so pumped. He finally did his first cycle because six months later, he went into that show at 244. So he you were there. 40 then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, was, I think I had a, had a few dad pops that night, actually. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I was pumped. But uh, yeah, he, he put on like 40 pounds of stage weight in six months where, where, where four of those months were dieting. You're the only person like, I've talked to on a podcast that I've known that's actually was there too. You can attest to this. Then there were growing men, like guys who like, like any of us who had been like competing all their lives, who dieted down for their show, getting the best shape they could. And Steve at his, how old was he again? Just turned 19. Just turned 19, <laughs> literally walked through that whole thing. Steve yeah. Kuklo and just wiped everybody out. Like, like there was no chance. Yeah, and that was kind of the start of the end of my career, kind of, because, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think I could have done well in bodybuilding. I had good structure, you know, but and I had to really work. I had to eat a lot and work really hard. And it was like, you know, this kid doesn't huh. know anything. He's doing a test and decacycle of baby doses. And, 
you know, it was, and he's already 245 on stage, you know, which is yeah. like that, that, I think that same year, Art Atwood had turned pro at 245, mm-hmm. you know, and it was like, good Lord, you know, and then, and also by then I, you kind of knew like Steve was going to be a phenomenal bodybuilder, but he wasn't Ronnie Coleman or in a year later, he wasn't Phil Heath, you know? And so it's yeah. like, God, you know, like how much, how much can I get out of this sport as a competitor knowing hmm. that my training partner is, you know, that much further ahead genetically than I am. And there are people that much further genetically ahead than him. You know, I mean, I knew he was going to be a great bodybuilder and, you know, and he was top five Olympia, top five. I think he did top five Olympia, but top five Arnold. Uh, But that was just kind of where I I kind of realized, like, I'm going to have to focus on the the education and the coaching side. That's where my my skill lies. Thank you for tuning in. And if we are providing value to you today, let me encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell. We have several bodybuilding podcasts that come out each week. Yeah. So in a way, Steve held you back <laughs> from your bodybuilding. <laughs> well, no, like, I mean the opposite. He was the greatest training partner you could ever. Oh imagine. no, no, no! But just that yeah. eye-opening, like, oh, yeah, it yeah, was just like a real realization. Plus, gear looks like. Yeah, it was that, and then also at the 2005 Junior Nationals, I had seven guys in that show, and I think all of them were top five except for me and and John Ward, who ended up taking second multiple John times. Ward. I don't think ever. Yeah, yeah. And so I had Brad Davis, it was Light Heavy, took second. Chris Perdue Carey took second. Uh, Darren Dudash, Ann Sheehan, all all these people were, you know, that all eventually went on to become pro bodybuilders at that show. And we're sitting around at the athletes meeting, and Phil came out, and he had Lift Studios had just done a thing on him. He, he won the Colorado. Hmm. And I don't know if I should tell this story because I don't want to say anything about, you know, PEDs and stuff with him, but. He knew nothing about them, and you know he nothing. was the whole talk of junior nationals. And yeah. we all we all knew he won. We, I mean, I feel bad for Chris Perticari because other than like the ninety one junior nationals with like Lavroni and Mayo, Chris Perticari would have won the heavies. It pretty much he was on point, stellar. You know, gutted out fully, just dog out glutes, incredible quads, and uh, and he took second to Phil. But we're sitting there talking to Phil, and you know he's asking us about like. He wasn't weighing his food, you know. He's eating like chicken and vegetables, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and we, I think someone asked him about you know like PDs, and I won't say what he took, but it was like what Steve took, you know, yeah. and which was not contest stuff. And so someone was like, "Well, like those are like he didn't know about anti-estrogens or anything." Yeah. And someone was like, "Well, when did you stop taking those?" And Phil's like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Like before the <laughs> show, when did you stop?" T-? And Phil's like, "Well, I did my last ones this morning." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it was like, good grief. You just kind of, your eyes open. It's like, all right, there's, you know, levels to this. So like, yeah. I, have, I have some genetic ability, you know, and it think some things like strength came easy to me, but like this guy's not, I'm weighing my food 365 days a year, like, you know, exactly and planning everything out. And this guy's like, yeah, I ate some chicken and broccoli and it took this thing the guy at the gym told me to put in my butt, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, doesn't know anything. And he's, and he won that, then won the USA's, then won the Colorado pro back to back to back, you know, basically as a natural. What, what year did you, uh, I think you got third at the USA's, right? Around I that wish. Time no, I think I got seventh in 2007. You got seventh? I thought you got like top five at, uh, in one of those years. Uh, that was, I, I think I could have, uh, that was the, like, I, if there's one thing, you know, like people say, like, I have no regrets. I'm not that person. There's lots of things I regret or wish I could do differently. <laughs> Maybe, you know, like people, you, they regret, like it's the worst one in the world. I don't think any of us go through life nailing everything, you know? Sure. And one thing I wish I could redo was that. And, and what screwed me was somebody, a pro, I think posted my, I did, they call, I, I, people call them like the back porch photos. I took some photos on the back porch and my two-year-old daughter was, who's now my social media manager, was uh, was posing with me, you know? And I remember I was 266. I was like two weeks out or 10 days out or something. And like, uh, uh, I think intense muscle and professional muscle all had like threads on it and everyone said, and I remember thinking like, God, I, I can turn pro, but I don't think I will now. And so huh. my brain just went to straight to, I just want to, I just want to go to the next off season and get to where I know I'm going to turn pro. And for whatever reason, I just lost it. It was like the, the drive to nail it for that peak was gone. And it was, and I couldn't get it back. You know, you go through and people always say like, well, you know, like, don't, can't you just eat, eat the food and dry out and drink the water? It's like, you can, but there, there's some type of intangible that you have to be mentally all in or it just doesn't yeah. work. Hmm. And it didn't, you know, and, and I like, I remember Nate Wolf, if you guys know him, uh, he was yeah. with Jay Cutler for a while. Yeah. 
uh, and he's he's from Michigan, and and he at the time he had just moved to Vegas. He was in, he was with the first extra nutritionist with me at Tripona Nutrition, and I remember like it just my head wasn't in it. I, I remember going there, and I was I was I. I, I don't know that I would have won, but I'm pretty sure I would have been top five when I went to see him. And I remember like my brain just was so illogical and I was bone dry. And I remember talking to him, I don't even like saying like, I think there's a little bit of water. I remember pinching my wrist to show water. And I remember him looking at me like, what is wrong with you? You, you know, like, shut up, you're ready. And it just, it just things, it just wasn't there, you know? And so I ended up like, I had like a watery back with strida glutes and you know mm -hmm. it was i wish i could redo that so so badly but you can't hey what's up guys i have a lot of people who reach out to me on a regular basis who are trying to more effectively reach their goals one of the biggest mistakes i see people make is that they're not getting enough protein and there's only so much chicken breast we can eat through the day but we can easily add a high quality protein supplement to boost those numbers up true nutrition has just about every protein powder you can think of from high quality weight isolate if you don't tolerate lactose then you could use their beef isolate or you could use their pea protein isolate if you don't eat animal products they literally have everything you'd think of i've believed in them for like a decade before they advertised with us and they they never went out of their way to say like hey we want to promote our stuff through you i literally asked them because it's a company that I believe in. And at the end of the day, I want to see you guys reach your goals as effectively as possible. So if you use our code, think at true nutrition, you'll get some savings. You'll help to support our programming and you'll get some high quality products to more effectively reach your goals faster. Hey, Skip, what was that topic? How do, how do we want to break that down? Basically it was building calories into the diet like as you're getting extremely lean as you're getting depleted you get to the point where you can start almost really loading building food up into the show how would you how would you describe that to justin well one of the examples was paul for his prep mm -hmm. where later in the prep there started to be this big push you know with carbs to the point where and correct me if i'm wrong the way i understand it there were some days that were just unlimited mm -hmm. carbs at, at least a thousand grams before his cheat meal yeah good yep. god yeah so it kind of got it got me thinking because you know i get this question a lot from people because it's a method that um i don't know is quite efficient and works very well and that is some people will start, you know, a prep and they'll go into a prep and they'll drop calories. They start high, they drop the calories down. And, you know, it's a, it's a pretty predictable method, increased cardio, things like that. Adjust at times, high carb days, loads, skip loads, whatever. But there's also the other option, <clears throat> which is to deplete early and almost to the point of slowing the, slowing the metabolism and then building the metabolism by reversing the calories to start coming up and it's like throwing gas on a fire. It's similar mm -hmm. in, in principle to skip loading. Um, but you just start feeding the metabolism and it's like a ball rolling downhill. Uh, yep. Sometimes to the point of you got to get control of the ball because just the more you eat, the leaner you get. Yeah. It starts so, running away. Eg exactly. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Uh, and, and like I said, it can, yeah, I don't know that you want to talk about Paul's specific situation that, was just what kind of, um, I don't know, brought up the questions when people knew that you were coming on. So there were, you know, I've had a handful of people, a handful of my clients going, ask Justin this. So if there's anything that you, you know, you want to touch on with that, whether it's with him or whether it's just a method that you use frequently, or it's just something that you ran into with Paul where you're like, oh man, this is, you know, this, his metabolism was just growing like crazy. Yeah, he's the perfect example, so I will use him because the first prep we did together, I didn't nail that, and his metabolism ran away on us, and we got to like six, five, four days out, and he was losing like four pounds a day, and by that point, it was too late to like, we're already starting to carve up, and he's still losing, you know, four pounds a day, and I felt really bad because we did his first prep together, and he was so depleted and over dieted on stage, and I felt terrible, and I sent, you know, I emailed him after, I was like, hey, man, you know, like, you don't owe me anything. You know, I thought we had a great prep up until about a week, week out. I didn't nail the final week. And I'm not one of those coaches who, I, like, I, you know, it's, you know, it's right there. The, the photos and video are right there. So I can't lie, you know. Yeah, and right. I, yeah. you know, I kind of told him, I was like, look, uh, you know, like, I, I missed the boat on that. I said, you totally understand if you go somewhere else. But I kind of, I said, you know, like, 
if you know, like if you stick around, we're about to have the most remarkable six weeks of your life. And he did. He had a massive rebound and he kind of built his whole coaching business off of that. You know, those yeah. those before and after photos. So it worked out. And then we knew for future shows what to expect. But like, I, I mean, I use analogies a lot and they, they kind of suck because no analogy is one to one. It's always like, you know, it's like I, I always hear people say, like, you know, you put take hold hands in a circle, you know, and, and then imagine God's in the center. Uh, what happens when you get closer to each other? You get closer to God. It's like, yeah, that's an analogy. But if you put the devil in the center too, the same thing holds, you know. So like analogies <laughs> don't always analogies don't always work. But I always say like uh, the hardest thing with prep is that at the start of prep, uh, what gives a better look is really really hard work, you know. And so it's really hard to get in shape. And so they yeah. kind of go like looking good and hard work go right in line for most of prep. And so it's really easy to lose focus and forget that the goal is to look good on stage. Yeah. And it's really easy to fall in that mindset of where the goal is to just suffer, you know, because suffering happens. Most of the prep, you, you, your brain starts like conflating the two and you forget that the goal is to nail it on stage. It's so always say like, you know, like we're trying to land like a, you know, an F-22 Raptor on a, on a, on a, on a uh, aircraft carrier, you know? Yeah, most of our our trip, we're flying at Mach 2, but then we have to land on this little character, you know, uh, uh, aircraft character perfectly, you know? We got to yeah. land the ship. We could kamikaze into it, you know, but that's not the best landing. And that's what, what, what the way I look at it is like most of the most of flight, yeah, we're starving, calories are low, cardio's high. But when we get there, then we got to land the, land the ship. And so what, what if you like what happens is like you start getting so flat, you know, and you take like if you think of a balloon, you know, you blow, blow a balloon up, a blue balloon, full, you can see right through it when it's fully blown up. You deflate it again. The skin's all thick and wrinkled. You can't see through it, you know, hmm. and that's kind of what you have to get to that deflated, wrinkled skin look at some point. But at that point, your metabolism's high, you're nutrient uh, partitioning sky high your gastric entering rate emptying rate sky high so if you start feeding that you know and blowing up the balloon you can thin the skin out metabolism keeps growing with it and it's kind of misleading because you're not you're probably still hypochloric for most of the week you know mm. just because you're not as hypochloric as you were at the peak of the diet you're not eating you're like you think your peak off season diet you're you're force feeding and they're you know you go week after week with no scale change you know and so people mm -hmm. like get in that mindset, they forget that, you know, you're eating 6,000 calories a day in the off season. I'm not telling you to eat, you know, 30,000 calories. I'm saying we're going from like 2,500 to 5,500. We're still probably hypercaloric, but that starts feeding the, your body, thyroid up, up regulates, you know, your body temperature climbs again, your skin starts thinning out, your muscles fill out with glycogen and the look keeps getting better and better and better and your metabolism keeps growing, you know, and that's like kind of landing that F-22 rather than just you know, smashing it into the aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. I like that analogy. That's good. I We've like got blue analogy. Yeah, that makes sense too, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one too. Yeah, besides, yeah, because uh, like, there's two phases to prep. There's like get the body fat off, yeah. and then make that physique look good. You know, when people forget the second phase, they just get so <laughs> stuck on that. You know, starve, suffer, starve, suffer, and it's like, well, once once we get to where there's no fat left, then we we got to pretty up your look. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of times people don't the, understand that that'll happen. You'll end up trying to load that last week, and you're just losing weight. Yeah, yeah. and it's and it's like this is counterproductive. If we're losing weight, uh, that <laughs> we're not filling out much here. Yeah, yeah, and it's so it's so hard. And but anyways, that prep knows what happens to your brain. It stops working, you know. And I think a lot of that came from two things like a lot of the old weeder magazines where they would talk about like no sodium for the last six weeks or <laughs> weird things that just don't work you know but that's all anyone read and if you read online you don't get the any contest prep information you find online is t usually terrible why why well one if the person's like talking about it for free it means they're not a good bodybuilder if you don't know if, <laughs> you know if, 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 if you know mike big muscles is posting on instagram about what you need to do or facebook or whatever if you don't know who he is, you don't know his name. It means he's not a top bodybuilder, you know, yeah. and then the coaches who know it, they're not giving that stuff away for free. And so most of the stuff you see online is so bad. It's like the opposite of what you should do. But that's what all almost every bodybuilder sees is the wrong things. Unless you work mm. with a coach or, or no top bodybuilders, all you see are all the wrong things to do. And they're like almost by definition wrong because it's being given to you by someone who's not a coach or a good bodybuilder. Nine times out of ten, too, uh, when I see these like um, 
Instagram infomercial things that guys are like, you know, it's just, if you type that term into Google, they're literally rehashing exactly the first thing that pops up in the AI definition of, of what, yeah. you know, whatever drug it might be or whatever, uh, you know, diet modality or anything. It, it's like, yeah, no shit, dude. I could have gone to Google and just typed that and gotten mm -hmm. an AI answer myself thank you yeah and so much of that dogma just gets passed down and passed it's so much it's so bad that as a coach like you like you know the truth and you have a client who's only read all these wrong things his whole life and trying to get them to believe uh, like you yeah. know so many of them think you got to go zero sodium like i've had clients say that you that they heard you're not supposed to brush your teeth the last three weeks because oh, that's sodium a real old school one yeah, yeah that's sodium one. fluoride yeah it's like no <laughs> Sodium's not the enemy, you know, like it can be the, you know, the, at the right time, even loading sodium can, you know, if you spike your blood, so because your blood sodium has to stay at 0.9%. That's like what you're, you know, that's why we can't drink seawater. You know, that's what our natural blood sodium is. So if you spike it to 0.1 or 0.10 for the like quarter pounder versus third pounder people who don't know fractions, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you spike it to that, you, your body has to increase the water volume of the, of the, of the blood. And if you're not drinking fluid, the only way it can do it is to pull water from the subcutaneous space into the blood vessels. And, you know, so you can use sodium to dry out if you time it properly. Yeah. Yeah. Where did the low, the no sodium thing come from? Because I, and I feel like it still is pervasive in the natural bodybuilding world. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, a lot of my natty friends, like I, I see their diets and it's like zero sodium written into every single meal. Man, I'm I don't know out. because sodium acts like an androgen. If you yeah. look at, uh, if you look at the, the pamphlet, the insert for aldactone, one of the side effects for men is gyno. Yeah, it's <laughs> anti androgen. Yeah. yeah, and they give it to women for 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 uh, uh, anti acne. Yeah, isn't it because it like, affects lowers male hormones? So it's like no. And so if you give one of those zero so if you ever want to like seem like a magician, have one of those zero sodium people add a tablespoon or a teaspoon <laughs> of baking soda to their to their workout drink and baking yeah. soda. It doesn't I mean it's a bicarbonate, but if you you, you can't change the, the the pH of your blood, if your blood changes by 0 0.1 pH, you die. And so yeah. you're really only changing the, the 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 pH of your stomach water. But it, but it sounds cooler than just having them add sodium, or you can have them add sea salt because that sounds cooler than just sodium too. But uh, <laughs> if you have if you have one of those low sodium people do that, they'll report back like. I don't know what that, I never had so much energy. I had the best pumps ever. I felt strong. It's like, yeah, because you actually were able to contract your muscles for the first time yeah. in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then wow. post-show, thanks to you and Paul, I think that we have been approached, but literally every client that I've met in the last year or two years has been like, I want to get as lean as I can so that I can get the reverse diet. I want to do, I want to gain 50 pounds. They all, thanks to, it's I'm fun, blaming, yeah. I'm blaming these two right here, him and Paul for that guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, there's nothing magical about it. And I do think there, what, what I think happens is, uh, like sarcoplasmic growth is a newer term. I remember doing a seminar with Ken Jackson's gym with John Meadows. Santi was there. I didn't think you were there, Skip. I can't remember who I was. There. I Did was you, there as an audience yeah, member. I was yeah. there for that. That and was that freaking point, awesome. That, that was a really cool one. But at that time, Wikipedia and like still that wouldn't it, wouldn't it allow you to list sarcoplasmic as any as actual muscle. You're kidding. Only do, no, it would only do the myofibrillar, huh. and which. You know, like looking back seems stupid because we know only about 30% of the cross-sectional area of your muscle is actual contractile tissue. The rest is other things. Now, whether or not that's muscle, if you define muscle as only myosin and actin, then know that other stuff isn't muscle. But, you know, like if, if you take a steak, that's muscle, right? Like that's cow muscle. If you dehydrate it onto beef jerky, that's the myosin and actin. You know, so obviously there's a big difference. So I think what's happening is you have this increased ability for rapid sarcoplasmic growth, tons of blood volume, tons of water, tons of glycogen storage, which are going to swell the blood vessels, probably increase the density of the microvasculature, increase the capillary density. And now that's not contractile tissue, but that's the infrastructure for contractile tissue. Yeah. So I think what you're doing is you get this kind of fake muscle, this overly ballooned up, filled up watery muscle post, post contest. I know it's not real muscle and that's not going to last forever because anyone who knows that after that, that period, you start losing that fullness and you don't look as awesome anymore. But you, I think you've built some level of infrastructure that allows for more myofibrillar growth the rest of the year. Yeah. I like that explanation that, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so let me just keep running with this for just a second, guys. So if we're, what about, 
what about using something like insulin then, where we're really able to kind of like super volumize uh, you, you water almost into need the muscle? Because yeah, if but, anyone's ever checked their blood sugar for the, for, for the two or three weeks after a contest, they're going to see that it's sky high, yeah. which is really yeah. counterintuitive. Well, the reason it's high is because your blood's dehydrated, which makes mm. zero sense because you're a waterlogged mess. But what's happening is your, 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 your blood sodium concentration is always above that 0.9%. It's always so high and your body's trying to hold so much water. Well, to store glycogen, you need glucose, you know, but then you need water. You know, glycogen is four to four and a half times as much water as it is glucose. And then you need sodium also. So you have all this need for the, this, all this water you're taking is trying to go out of the muscles, trying to go under the skin. It's going all over. You have all this need for water. Your blood sodium concentration is sky high. And so even though like you're a waterlogged mess, technically, as far as glycogen storage is concerned, you're dehydrated. There's not enough water and sodium to combine with the, combine with the glucose to form glycogen and hold all that extra water and edema. And so you almost kind of need insulin even to maintain somewhat sane blood sugar levels for the two weeks after a contest. Do you like to add in a, uh, like a basil then? I don't. And I, I mean, and this might be, this isn't a hill I'm willing to die on. And this might be something I changed my views on long term. Uh, right. I just, I have a type one daughter and I, you know, and I've overweight family members are type two. And I think it gets lost in that, Yes, Lantus will improve your blood sugar level. Obviously, it's insulin. No, Lantus will not improve your insulin sensitivity, and the opposite actually will occur. It's going to desensitize it over time. And so I, you're already w struggling with you know maintaining proper blood sugar levels on your own. I prefer to use tissue sensitizers more than Lantus, like metformin and berberine, and then mm -hmm. short, like short-acting insulin, Humalog or Novolog or Novorapid. What about, um, in your opinion, like, so you get done the show, you know, you're two weeks into like a nice little, you know, post-show rebound blast. Would you recommend doing, say, like a third week of going back almost like a contest diet to regain that sensitivity versus using, you know, the tissue sensitizers and, and, and you know, things of that nature? I'm not, I'm not against that, but I kind of, I always try to, try to say like, why fight what the body's doing? We we can't mm. affect it too much. And so the body wants to store water. It wants to be full. So I say, let's ride that out. We, we only get at most six weeks and most people probably four weeks before that starts trailing off pretty hard. So of a 52 week year, we get four of them where this is, you know, this is something that's happening at a much higher rate than any other time. I say, ride it out. And then usually after four, maybe six weeks, then we'll do that. Yeah. But I, I wait till that rebound is like fully over and we start seeing their, you know, because their weight will shoot up, shoot up, shoot up, and then it starts leveling. And when it starts leveling and kind of cresting that hill, I'll say, okay, rebound's over. You know, let's let's drop the TRT. Let's bring calories back down. Let's get your blood sugar in a good range. Get blood work. Verify everything's healthy. Recalibrate. And then four to eight weeks from then, then we'll start the main off-season push. I feel like that four to six weeks you're talking about also coincides to where like the athlete hits like another like mental wall, like a, like a second mental wall post where the fatigue sets in they start yeah. the joints. They start to have like sleep issues again that whereas, you know, after the show you're eating, you're, you're happy and fat, you're going to yep. bed and you're sleeping eight to 10 hours easily. Yep. And then you yeah. kind of start to hit that wall again. And even in the training starts to show too, like, you know, yeah, maybe they're I on this upward rise and now, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I always say, yeah, like you said, they're happy and fat, and then they're sad and fat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's that, there's that, that depression hit because you're like you're in prep, and prep's weird because you hate it. You hate every minute of it, but every minute is hyper important. Your life never feels as important as it's going to be in prep because every meal is make or break. Every workout is make or break. Every cardio, every everything you put in your body feels like the most important thing you've ever done. And then the show is over, and then you get this period where it's like, oh, food's amazing. I'm eating, and then you get, you know, I'm, I'm strong, I'm full. This is awesome. And and then yeah. suddenly it's like I'm not getting stronger and fuller anymore. Now every day is just a normal day. I just have, now I have to go to work. Yeah, nothing special is happening. It does. If I don't weigh my food out this meal, no one will even know. My coach won't even know. Nothing matters anymore. Oh, you know, <laughs> it sucks. You start to get fatter and flatter. Yeah, uh, yep. yeah. The depression sets in. Why am I yep. doing this? That whole yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a perfect time to switch gears and give them a new focus. I think. Yeah. We had a couple of comments, but well, we had a bunch of comments. We had a bunch of questions for you too, Justin. And one of them was, uh, we have to kick Andrew off because he's the only one not from Michigan on the show. Right. How about well, that? I, I was actually <laughs> going to point out, like, I feel like when I first got on Intense Muscle, Michigan was like the bodybuilding capital of the world, I felt like, between like Justin and Shelby's from Michigan, right? Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, I feel, and I knew Skip from Livonia, I think. Royal Oak. Yeah. 
He's over Royal there. Oak, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I knew Skip had the connection to, to that, Michigan. <laughs> um, there were other couple of good bodybuilders I knew from that area. Uh, isn't Art Watwood from Michigan or Wisconsin, somewhere in that Wisconsin, region? Wisconsin, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I just yeah. felt like the, like the Midwest was like the spot to be for bodybuilding, which is funny because I'm from Iowa originally, and I and then I ended up on the East Coast. That's but, the spot to be for wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't a wrestler. I, I played college ball, uh, college football, but not a oh, know, nice. not at a high level. But, and I, I've seen um, this other one before too. This guy Dom, I, and I have to correct. Oh, Dominic. People. He says, uh, um, he says Justin and Scott are for sure long lost cousins. So we've got the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> we've got the. I'm going to tell you though, you, you guys have to see us standing next to each other because Justin is like an entire foot taller than I am. So you would, you would see the difference really quick if you saw us in you person. Do, you yeah. never get the Seth Rogen comments, right? That's how you know we look different. Every yeah, no, time I get that. Instagram post, or <laughs> even see worse, it. I did. I do see I, it. I, I, now I, I can't see it. unsee it. Yeah. I, just, I hate it. Yeah, come on. Like, that's like, no one wants to hear that. But I, I did Mark Bell's podcast and it was right after I had surgery and I was, I was supposed to, I didn't think this, I'm an idiot. Like you never believe the doctors. They were like, they told me to take like, like a long time off work and it was like three days and I was on a flight and like I was stuck in the airport. There's nothing to eat. I had chicken wings and I go to this podcast, my face is all swollen. And like the very first comment is like, we're supposed to listen to nutrition advice from fat Seth Rogan. <laughs> Come on. Pretty good. It is good. <laughs> I was like, "Isn't he already fat?" Why well, I'm, <laughs> I'm the fat <laughs> Seth. Rogen. Yeah, right. You could, have, uh, you could have made like a whole Instagram, YouTube, like personality of like, like, uh, like Jack Seth Rogan, and probably yeah. would have, uh, would have like hit it off really well. <laughs> yeah. work on his life. Yeah. All right. How about this I'll, one? I'll film with Catherine Heigl. If that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of our listener questions is uh, for you, Justin. Best way to manage blood sugar during an off season for somebody who is metabolically challenged. And this is a client of mine, actually. We, uh, I, should I throw him under the bus? I'm going to throw him under the bus just a little. Yeah. He's a good guy. We started working together and um, things weren't lining up for a contest. I was like, you know, you ever have any issues with blood sugar? What's your blood sugar? Any? He's like, well, I, I do have medications for that that I'm supposed to take. <laughs> and I was like, that I, that I haven't oh. told you about. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe we should take that. And a little while later, it's things still weren't lining up. And I said, you know, what about your thyroid? And this is all within the you know first few weeks. He's like, well, I, I, I did get a prescription for thyroid medication that I'm not taking. So you know who you are, but he, you know, we, we've got things in a good path at this point. And, and I think through this process, he's kind of had, he's developed a, a, a better understanding of himself and he knows he's going to have to really pay attention to these things in the off season. So he had written in a question to you, which is what's the best way to manage blood sugar during an off season? Cause he knows he's not going to be able to blow it way up um, for somebody who's metabolically challenged. Well, I mean, a proper diet and exercise is always going to be number one. But I, I mean, insulin sensitivity. So, it, you know, the way insulin works is like any any hormone, it binds to a receptor. It's how I, I do this every time. But I always picture a receptor as like a cup. And then like insulin would be a ball and it fits in that cup. And when it does that, it shuffles some proteins around and it, and it causes an influx of nutrients in the muscle, like influx of glu or glycogen and amino acids. But what happens over time is when you have so much insulin because you're eating so much sugar and so much fat and, and your, your tissues get desensitized, so that cup doesn't work very well anymore. It's all broken. So the insulin might go in there and then fall out. It doesn't activate the receptor. So you want to, you want to improve that receptor sensitivity. And the best over-the-counter product for that by far is berberine. And I'm going to plug my supplements sorry but uh the best berberine product i believe is our suppressor max because it, it has sodium cap rate which is a 10 chain 10 carbon chain fatty acid that's a permeability enhancer so the problem with berberine is it gets broken down really quickly and it's not very good at getting across the small intestine you know mm -hmm. and so some people looked at dihydroxy berberine and dihydroxy berberine does seem to have a higher bioavailability but the problem is in any study with dihydroxy berberine it doesn't improve glucose over berberine you know it seems like it should work better but it doesn't seem to have the effect what well uh sodium cap rate and there are studies you can google sodium cap rate and berberine and see the research studies does it not only improve the the permeability and the absorption of berberine but more importantly improves blood glucose control like 20 to 22 and a half percent better than glucose alone and it increases the duration of action so when you take berberine 
you know, you have to take it multiple times a day, almost every meal, really, because by hour two, it's already plummeting as far as blood concentrations. If you add sodium caprate to berberine, you'll have concentrations of, of berberine in the blood at hour six that are almost two times as high as berberine alone at hour two. Hmm. And so really, so like our suppressor max, I, I, I always say is the only once a day berberine, because that's the problem with berberine. You're, you're giving it to someone who has blood sugar problems for a reason. They, you know, they, yeah. they've had a life where they haven't been really focused on things. So asking them to take a supplement three or four times a day, every day, the rest of their life is asking a lot. So I think mm -hmm. it's a big deal for people like that, where they can just take it all in the morning. Uh, but berberine for sure. Other than that, metformin. Um, and then I try to stay away from, I try to look at, uh, insulin as a purely for bodybuilding and hypertrophy effect, you know, and insulin's really amazing because you can actually stay leaner on insulin, which is, I think people misunderstand all the time. If you take yep. someone on an, on a given diet and you say, you're on this diet, this calorie, this carb intake, and we know it's working and we know your body fat composition and we know we're making progress. Now take that exact same diet and add insulin to it. What happens? Some of those that glucose that might otherwise have been stored as fat now has a higher potential to be stored as glycogen. You know, thermodynamics stays true. You're still storing those calories. Only now, rather than storing them fat, there's some potential to be stored as, as glycogen. Same with amino acids. Some of those amino acids that might go through gluconeogenesis and then the fatty acid synthesis pathway to be stored as fat now have a slightly higher chance to be synthesized as new muscle tissue. So, so thermodynamically, nothing changed. Same calories in, same calories stored. Only the likelihood that those excess calories are stored as muscle and glycogen rather than fat are higher with insulin. So I think people get that completely wrong with insulin, and like, which is why Milo Sarchev is always in shape despite taking tons of insulin. Insulin, when used properly, will keep you leaner. When people use insulin wrong, for years they would say, I'm going to take 10 IUs of insulin and then I'm going to eat this many carbs to cover it. Well, yeah. you don't know if that diet works. Well, yep. if, you, if you take your diet and apply insulin and titrate the insulin to that diet, you're going to stay leaner. If you just take some amount of insulin and eat as much as you can so you don't get, go hypo, well, yeah, you're going to eat fat because you don't know if that diet worked without the insulin. Uh, yeah, I feel like we're constantly on the show um, correcting people's misconception that insulin makes you fat and mm -hmm. it, it, calories make you fat. You know, yeah. it, it, in, in misuse of, of, of compounds with the calories make you fat. But yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, that's my big, one of my biggest pet peeves. And that's another dogma that got pushed around because yep. like when people say you can't eat fat with, with insulin, <laughs> you can't eat excess calories, you know, yeah. but yeah. all things being equal, if you eat excess calories, you're actually more likely to store those calories as non-fat with the insulin, yep. you know? Yep. Exactly. Yeah, the, fat, uh, the fat intake is one that is always been an issue for me that I've considered to be quite dogmatic as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't like you, you, you've committed some kind of bodybuilding, you know, you've, you, you've faltered on the commandments of bodybuilding. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's just a, it's an odd thing, but that it's is so bad that it's like, it's not, it, it, you have to debate whether it's worth like explaining. It's like, okay, is it, am I going to write a 30 page novel to convince this guy or am I just going to say, yeah, fine. I can't deal with it anymore. But yeah, the truth is no, it, it, you can have fat with insulin because you, every time you eat fat, you produce insulin anyway, any meal, you, you know, you've done it your whole life. I, I feel like, um, and, I, and I'm ultimate respect for Dante. I feel like maybe some of his early DC diets might've influenced a lot of people that grew up like in the 2005 to 2010 or even earlier thinking, you know, cause his whole thing was separating, you know, your, your protein and carb meals and your protein and fat meals. So I think people took that as dogma is like, I can't combine fats yeah. and carbs yeah. in any meal or I'm going to get fat and my bodybuilding is going to suffer because of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a tough thing with what we do is because we're not talking to other nutritional experts. And when you're talking to someone who knows nothing about, you know, and you, you take someone who's trying to gain weight and they don't know anything about calories and they were eating pizza at night and they're eating, you know, 1500 calories in one meal from pizza. And now you have them remove that and just eat a protein and fat meal. Now they're only eating 700 calories, you know, yeah. and it's really like more that that's where it was. And for someone yeah. who doesn't know anything, that makes it more difficult to completely screw things up when you treat it the way Dante did. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the most optimal way if you're working with someone who understands everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. How about um, this one? Uh, what's the biggest amount of food that you've ever eaten and what's the biggest amount of food that you've ever given an athlete? I assume the eating part was back in the DC days. Yeah, I could eat. So I think back to because I eat nothing now. I, I posted like what I eat in a day and I, I don't I, I usually I'm, I'm pretty simple. I, I don't cycle anything anymore. I, like 
<laughs> cycle ca- carbs anymore. I just, I basically eat like six ounces of meat with like 50 grams of carbs in a meal. And then if my meat's really lean, I'll add like seven or 10 grams of fat. If my meat's not really lean, I won't add fat. And that's it. And I eat as many times as I'm hungry. And usually it's like four or five meals a day. It's about where and I'll I'm hold at. two. Yeah, I hold about 250, 255 eating fat, which is nothing because I would prep on way more than that back then. The most yeah. I ever ate was when I would do the nine meals a day and it would be, uh, these were not my high days. These are my regular days. Uh, well, my my regular days would be, uh, and I, I'm taking it down seven when I was like hyper obsessed. I, I, I went on this thing where I was like, only flank steak and rice, probably stupidly, but I like I convinced myself that those were, you know, red meats, the closest amino acid profile to human <laughs> amino acids, probably rice is easily di- and I love rice. I still love like the texture, the flavor, it absorbs salt, it absorbs any season you add brilliantly. It's easy to cook, it's easy to, you know, shovel in. So I would eat like I think I can't remember if I was doing six or eight ounces of meat and two cups of rice, and I would do six meals of that a day. But on my high days is when I would alternate, and I would do like six ounces of meat, two cups of rice, and then 90 minutes later, I would do 50 grams of whey isolate. And this was when I was with Dante, so Dante was sponsoring me, so I had all the carbon protein powder I want. So I would do whey isolate with, back then, I don't think, when well, Waxy Maze had come out, so it would be that and 100 grams of Waxy Maze, and I would alternate for, there would be nine total meals. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, yeah, over a thousand grams of carbs, I, feel, I think. I feel like I stole that from you, actually, because I, I was on the same, exa- right when Project Heavy, Super Heavyweight came out. And I was working with Dante, too, at that time. But So maybe there's some iteration coming from him, but th- th- that was solid protein, uh, solid shake, solid shake, eight meals a day. And it was, mm. I, I didn't actually weigh my foods. He never had me weigh my foods. It was eat as much flank steak as you could and then try to get two cups of rice in with it. Mm-hmm. And then if you're still hungry or if you could have a protein drink with it and then, yeah. you know, an hour and a half, two hours later, it would be 75 grams away and like 75 to hundred grams of either Malto or uh, wax yeah. maize or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And Definitely. it was crazy. I was, I was so lean then too. And I like thinking back to how, like, and I was so hungry. All I would, I'd be like, you know, like 90 minutes felt like an eternity before eating and uh, it's like remarkable mm-hmm. looking back what you can do to a metabolism because my body weight's not that much different you know i remember when i started prep that year i was like 265 and now that was after a cruise like trt but that's what i do now and i'm yeah. 255 so i'm 10 mm-hmm. pounds less and i'm not fat well, i'm probably fairly similar in body fat to what i was in the off season then but like I'm eating less than half the calories. It's crazy how much you can, you know, they say you can't really change your metabolism, but I have like so many cases of dramatically affecting someone's metabolism, including my oh, own. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And how about no, for that, a client? How, like how far, who, who's the guy that you've uh, fed the most? Cause I know you, I've heard you, I mean, over the years now, you've worked with a lot of guys who've handled a lot of food. Luke Sando could eat. Luke Sando, we would got up to like 10 ounces of meat, per meal with a thousand grams of carbs three or four times a week so that was you know six or seven thousand calories paul gets up there i'm trying to think uh oh geez cole Elsber- albersworth right now this dude he's like 290 in very good shape he's got some glued outlines and we've just like annihilated his metabolism to where i think he's at like 1200 grams of carbs uh and 60 grams of protein per meal for six meals three days a week uh, his other training days are 70 grams of protein. That's direct protein, not counting the protein and the carbs or the fat sources. No. So his true total calories are even higher. And I think he's at like maybe 750 grams of carbs plus around 100 grams of added fat with 70 grams of protein per meal plus an intra workout on his on his other training days. And then it's got to where like the food volume just gets so high, they start getting distended, you know, maybe not like, yeah. like forward distended, but like the waist starts kind of getting that like bowed out. You know, just there's so much food and stuff. So we've even started adding. Uh, so now he has four cheat meals a week. Two of them, or no, five cheat meals a week. Jeez, three of them are at the, the last meal of the day on high day, like before he goes to bed, which seems counterintuitive, but it's done for a reason because he's not hungry at all at that point. And so it, it, the cheats aren't that crazy. And then two of them are post workout on the on the regular carb days. What um, do you think that in a way? Because I've I've started kind of 
try to pull back from the high feeding, do you think in some t- in some cases it's a detriment that we get these metabolism so high that hmm. it's so hard to gain muscle when yeah. our metabolism is bur- going at 150% of what it would on a natu- in a normal situation where now we're like, dude, we're running out of time in the day or now yeah. like your off days are now higher than your, than your training days, right? Because you just yeah. can't get that amount of volume when you're trying to train for two hours. And if you're, if you carbs like, like I do, if you're not, if you're not slightly hypocaloric on the low days, then the high days are just fat storage days, you know, so mm. you're limited there also. But yeah, that's where Cole's at. And it's like, God, you kind of feel cause it cause you're like, you, you're, you're, you're trying to build a metabolism and then it kind of crests that hill really quickly on you where you're like, oh yeah. shit, I can't feed you. What am I going to ask you to do? 100 grams of protein and 100 grams of carbs eight times a day? I, you know, like there's only so yeah. much. And yeah. you can do that, but you start getting that like A shape to the to the midsection yeah. Yeah. where the ribs start, sp- like Craig Kovacs used to have it. And then there's like the between the serratus and the rectus abdominis start spreading out. And the, like, yep. you know, like if you, guys that get that, and it's like, I think it's just from so much food volume. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we've we've moved to like, more calorie dense meals with him uh during the week because he's still very lean which is awesome but he could you know like he's got the frame to hold 300 pounds in good shape and if we're 290 now how do we get 10 because 10 pounds is a lot people think like yeah i'll add 10 pounds like 10 pounds of muscle is hard 10 pounds of bloat it's not so hard but you know 10 pounds on at that point is we can't feed that any you know like so yeah it's, that's a it's a tricky thing to manage because it's another thing like like with prep you know like you spend all this time trying to do one thing and do one thing and then boom all of a sudden oh crap we did we're going too far with it now we got to you know re- rail it back in mm-hmm. yeah it's almost like we want to try to find a way to like there's a happy medium, right? Like, like they, we, we want to expose you to calories, amino acids, et cetera. But then like, there's that point where like you're saying, like, if it's going to be a detriment to the physique in the longer term, like, like I think Skip said in the last show, you know, if you put on, you know, five inches in your shoulders, clavicles and everything, but you put four inches on your waist, like how much is that going to improve? Like your front relax is shot at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's like this happy medium. I feel like we're trying to, we, we figured out now that we're trying to, we're trying to get to. Yeah, and it's hard to know what because what I think probably all of us would think is probably the ideal physique if we really boil it down versus what gets judged, you know, isn't always like I'm just trying to word this, but I think like back to Arnold, you know, and those guys and they had tiny waist because they didn't eat that much, you know, yeah. but they weren't trying to force their metals. They also didn't weigh that much, you know, Arnold was True. big, but he's like 6'2", 240, you know, that's like, you know, C-bomb's bigger than that now. Well, would Arnold even turn pro today? That's what I, I mean. I, I, I mean, say no. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, his look, but he would be different if he lived. Yeah, exactly. Today, That's, you know, yeah, he need to learn yeah. how to get into condition. He need to learn how to get into that extra level of condition because he never brought a peeled physique to, to, yeah. the, to the stage. And, right? Yeah. And and I used to be more of an Arnold basher because I, I would say that like, yeah, I'm like that look when it went in, there's no way he's winning the USA's anymore, but it, he would look different now. You know, he would have modern technology and stuff, but I do think we lost our path a little bit because some of those poses with their tiny waist, you know, not, you know, not to be too gay, but it's like, this is a pretty look, you know, <laughs> it looks pretty good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I wish you, we you know could. What's, you know, what's visually appealing and you know, what's, what's aesthetically you look mm. like, okay. You put up a bumstead in his front relaxed or even a front double next to like Hani or Hani. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, Hani pound for pound muscle it's amazing yeah. it's a crazy thing to look at and he's deservedly you know been a mr olympia but i think if most of us were surveyed we'd be like man i'd really like to have chris's physique more so than a hottie mm-hmm. yeah, yeah and i think at some point i don't know what i mean who knows what's going to happen but i think like because i think chris could do open and i think he could do really well and i think at some point if it, it might not ever happen because it's moving now to where the you know, like the the fame and maybe not the money in the competing, but com- you know, all the money is now in your social media. You know, the way you can monetize your following is yeah. so outrageously high. The the yeah. the amount of the wealth generation from having followers is so dramatically higher than we I mean, got take guys like we always heard of like the Nelk boys or like Steve will do it. You know, like mm-hmm. they don't I mean, I guess they make like happy dad hard cider or something now but they don't produce anything but just the fact that because you think like you know cnn gets what like four hundred thousand viewers a night you know where these yeah, guys have tougher. you know 40 million viewers yeah. so the the ability you have to monetize that is so outrageously high 
I don't know that anyone's going to care to move to open, but I think mm. if you took someone like Seabomb and had him focus on open, that would be a really incredible physique. That'd be such a cool uh, story, too. I mean, I, I know I, he's I, not going to do it, but just imagine how exciting bodybuilding would be yeah. if oh, he yeah. told oh, us, yeah. like, guys, I'm going to do it. Just pull the mm-hmm. reins off and see what we can hit, you know? Because from I'm, what I'm I hear, sure. he, he's, he's got some reins on, too. That's yeah. what I hear. Like, yeah. Well, I, I think this is actually his last year competing. I've, I've I think you're right. My authority that um, he's moving on with, and, and for the reasons Justin just alluded to, the social media status, the the other business ventures that just produce so much more than being a Mister. Olymp- you know, what do you win for Mister. Olympia in classic? Hundred K, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think he makes that in a month on his code sales. Oh, for, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, what is, how many Rod. followers does he have? Mil- several million. I mean, yeah. You. If you've got 3 million followers and you just sell clothing and you monetize $1 per month <laughs> per follower, it's 3 million a month. You know, It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Hey, that led yeah. me to a good off-topic question. I want to ask all you guys, but we'll start with our guest, Justin. Um, tips to become financially self-reliant. Invest. Yeah, and in what? Invest. Well, I mean, I'm not a financial advisor, but it's not hard. <laughs> you don't have to be. Invest okay. in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, SPY yeah. or VOO and QQQ. If, and I did a, I did a reel and I just said, I, it was like, it was, it was like, if you t- start when you're 20 and do, I think it's even like $100 a month in SPY or triple Q until you're 65, it's $5 million yeah. at, at, at what it's annualized growth. So, you know, and the, see, the problem is why people don't understand investing is because you do your 401k and you think that's going to be enough. And you're supposed to put 20% of your income into the 401k and no one does that, but you think that's going to work. Well, so if you think about it, it's like, okay, for 30 years, I live on 80% of my income and then I put 20% away and then I'm supposed to live on 30 years from that 20% and I'm expected to be wealthy. No, that's not, that's not going to work. 401k was never meant to, 401k was meant to be a supplement to pensions. And if you look at the wording of a 401k, it's not a retirement plan. It's meant to be like an additional supplement when you have excess income to your pension, but you should, you should always invest, max out your 401k, IRA, backdoor Roth, and you should have a brokerage account on top of that where you're trickling money in anytime you can. And you don't have to understand investing. Never invest in single stocks unless you're like a financial advisor because you'll always Nancy, lose money. Nancy Pelosi or, or one of the Congress. Yeah, uh, just people. you can follow. Yeah, you can see. Or what is it? There's there's a couple. Uh, Dat, Dataroma, D-A-T-A-R-O-M-A. Google that and you can see what all the best hedge funds hold. Uh, but you don't need to. And if you just invest in the ETF exchange traded fund SPY, which is the uh, uh, a weighted version of SP 500, you'll beat ninety percent of of professional investors. So you're in the top ten percent of investors just by putting your money in there. You can't lose. You know yeah. it's. And, but the pro- other problem is over any five year period, investing in the stock market is basically worse than a savings account because hmm. it could, you know, like if you started investing uh, in like twenty eighteen. There was a period of time in 2022 where you might have you would have been negative in money, especially yeah. because you don't invest all at the start. You invest over time, and then the market goes down 30 percent in 2022, and so you're like, "This is terrible." It's a time you know time thing, which bodybuilders should understand because no one turns pro in five years, you know. But yeah, it's a uh, this because uh, I don't I didn't grow, I'm really very obsessed with investing. We and we. Uh, I invest heavily. Uh, we do uh, we do real estate. We own uh, Harris Investment Properties. We own storage units and the car wash. No we kidding. Do hard money. We do hard money lending to a home flipping company, uh, and then I invest very very. Del- I mean obsessively. We're our daily what, recurring investments. Hmm? What's your take on the hard money uh, lending? Like what? Uh, like what are your? Terms oh, so, it's so sc- I'm, well, It's amazing. I do twelve percent straight uh, straight yeah. interest. Usually a three three months turnaround. So it's forty eight percent APR. Because I've been thinking about getting into that lately. But there's no guarantee you're ever going to get your money. Yeah, exactly. That's the reason. You know, so you, you have to have a you – I've, I've never not, not got money back. Uh, I have I have money out with a hedge fund who's refusing to pay, and I've even won a court case on it. Uh, that, that, but they, they know how to do that because they know that they can drag that out for three years before it goes to collections, and they'll pay you, but they've had three years to make money on your money, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. like – but – and I, I've invested in uh, – uh, like Series A and Series B, there's a uh, the third Bevco. Uh, they're producing a, a, a several products, like a product called Eight Energy Drink, a couple, uh, uh, I think, mushroom drinks and stuff. And I invested in them 2020, I think. And so 
when I invested, it was less that you're investing. It's pre it's pre IPO. So they haven't made a public offering. The plan is to IPO. So they start out with like a seed funding, you know, series A, series B and keep getting bigger. And the plan is to IPO. And you get like right now, I think I have 75,000 shares with them. And it was I paid less than a dollar a share. And right mm-hmm. now they're the, the current the current series B round is four dollars a share to invest. So mm-hmm. that like that. So that initial investment, which was you know around fifty thousand for me, is now valued at three hundred thousand. That's great. Those, but though, but if that's if it IPOs, it, it may never IPO. So you take those risks. Those are the huge, like hard money is like that. It's like you know huh. you're not going to get forty eight percent rate return on 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 your you know on your four hundred one k. You can with hard money lending, but you can also the company goes under and they don't pay you back. No. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you guys? But if you have a good, I mean, I would echo everything Justin just said. Um, Diversify between you know your S and P, your 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 regular ETFs, and then um, you know I also like to look at other opportunities like the real estate. Um, Like we're looking at a couple properties tomorrow. Um, I also like to invest in companies that uh, like like startups when they're doing crowdfunding before they do the IPO. Thing. Mm-hmm. So I so I, I I do set aside money to like look at com- uh, companies that I think are going to do really really well in the future. Trying to get in early, like like Justin said, you know, paying you know what under seventy five cents a share or something like that, and then seeing it quadruple, you know, a couple of years. Yeah, later. it could IP it could IPO at, at fifty a share. Those they're like you do yeah. a small amount with those, but they like uh, Chamath Palap and Patia was he owned Social Capital. He was one of the first Facebook guys, and uh, it's a multi billion dollar uh, Social Capital is the company. But he says if when they get uh, like seed funding uh, requests, if it's under five hundred thousand, he doesn't even read it. He just gives them the money because any of those that work are hundred x, you know. Yeah. So yeah. if 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 ninety nine of them fail and one of them succeeds, you know, a hundred x is enormous. And so you're basically throwing away a small portion of your money, saying. I would have spent this on, you know, cocaine and hookers. Instead, I'm going to spend it on this dream. And if one of them pans out, it's it's a huge, huge turnaround. Yeah. In real estate, you can't like, like the the, the easiest investment is ETFs because you just put money in and it grows and it happens. Real estate, I mean, think of your average billionaire. First person you think of is probably a real estate mogul, you know, or a business owner. Yeah, I always look at this as like, you know, like money money can be recreated. Like the government prints money left and right, devaluing our dollar all the time. Right. But mm. like property is a finite commodity. Like there's only so much land mm. on this earth. So that's what Dusty I think says you, too. Yeah. I think, so I think that like real estate's the way to go for long-term, you know, financial stability. Um, <laughs> Just because it, it's going to withstand, you know, the test of time with like markets and, and who's president at the time and, and what war is going on. And so you like, it's never not it, your land is never going to be worth zero yeah. and nobody's home nuclear. nobody's home 50 years later is worth less than it was when they bought it you right. if it's if it's, like it's still nuclear, standing let's just yeah. a nuclear war or something and there's yeah like no and at that point yeah yeah everything's flatter <laughs> the other thing with real estate people don't don't realize is and and that like growing up because my parents were working class i didn't understand these things when we first looked at our at our storage units we, uh, uh, the way I met it is I found this hillbilly with a Fu Manchu on a vacation and he's like, <laughs> just like spending money and he's got this big rhinoceros rife and they're waiting around the pool and he's drinking, you know, like Bud Reds and, uh, you know, and I was like, I gotta find out what's up with this guy. And he was in, <laughs> he was in storage units. And so it was really interesting. So when we got back home, I went right online and like Googled storage units for sale. Well, I just got lucky because storage units never go to sale for sale because they're like a gold mine. I mean, our storage huh. units, yeah, probably less than two hours of work a year. No kidding. But, but I found an auction for one, and uh, and I thought like, what can we afford, you know? But then I realized like, well, you're you're only paying the down payment. That's what people don't realize. Like, if you buy a half a million dollar property, it's like yeah. God, I don't have half a million dollars. Well, no one does. I mean, you, you, 20% is 100000 so you might not have that either. But what you're doing is you're buying a $500,000 property for 100000 The bank buys the rest. Your renters pay that down. But yeah. even better, it's always appreciating in value. And I'll use our storage units, for example. We got them like – so I – uh, I was going to, uh, it was like an automated, you know, uh, auction where you just put your bid in and it just runs, you know, and, and the people slowly get knocked off. And I was going to put 200,000 as our bid. And I thought, you know what? I bet you someone else does that. I'll do 201,000. And okay. that ended up being the one that won, wow. you know, yeah. but, 
So we so we, we had to have forty thousand, which at the time was gonna was a, a down payment where we were working on to buy a new home. And so this was like stressful, but it's like okay, we so we buy this property for for forty thousand. That's all our our money is. Now, like five years later, uh, the renters have been paying it down. You know, our mortgage stays the same through inflation and everything. And a, a, a car wash was for sale in the area, and I was looking at it and the same. It was like oh, it's a lot of money for the down payment, but I was like, well, let me like. A, assess our property see what the value is well our property our storage units were worth like five hundred thousand at that point so hmm. they had they had grown eighty thousand dollars a year in you know in even better than income because you don't pay taxes on that income's the worst because 35 percent of it goes to the government right away yeah so we refinanced took out the uh down payment for the car wash and paid for that so the car wash we got for free Huh, you know? yeah. So using use collateral, use, using the, um, yeah. the, the the storage as collateral. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and and the same thing. So the car wash, we put no, nothing of our own money and then people pay the car wash, you know, they go to the car wash and that pays their mortgage. And it's like, man, this is like, it's kept like the first couple of years I was like waiting for the catch because I didn't understand, you know, I was new to investing. I was like, this is too good to be true. But, that, you know, like... <laughs> If you can get in when interest rates, like interest rates suck right now, so it's a terrible time, but they're going to plummet at some point. The Fed's going to uh, lower interest rates. You know, they'll, they'll go back down to zero. Yeah, that's the, I mean, they would say that last year too. But yeah, if they, if they do, yeah, I mean, it's going to be like, because you're going to be at the tail end of this high interest rate where so many people are have been losing their ass and, and don't have the patience and panic and they're going to sell because they're going to, you know, because they're going to see this total number. So you you know you get a five hundred thousand dollar property at eight percent interest. It's the same as buying a million dollar property at at three percent interest. You know, mm -hmm. and so they're going to see that that you know, you, you like it may, right now they can't get five hundred thousand for it, but it, interest rates plummet. You offer them six hundred thousand. They say like I'm making six hundred. I couldn't even get five hundred. Where you're yeah. buying it for the same monthly mortgage as if it was two fifty. Yeah. You know when the interest rates were eight percent. And so like that's like understanding how that works is like. Just you can always refi too. Yep. I mean, yeah. the, someone in real estate told me like, look, you, you marry the property, you date the interest rate. Yeah. And you can yeah. always you can always renegotiate that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and even better if you have brokerage account investments, you can start because I I really don't use I try to be completely out of the banking world now. I use margin loans all the time, and I did a couple videos on it. I bought when Trump got shot. I, I took out I took out a sixty thousand dollar margin loan to buy. I, I tried to put I tried to buy sixty thousand dollars worth of his company stock, that but I knew it, like everyone was. So you can only buy after hours in overnight trading at twenty percent of the closing price. And so I put like every sixty thousand dollars worth of orders at at that twenty two thousand dollars hit. Uh, when I woke up, so I bought it for it was like thirty two dollars a share or something. 22,000. I woke up at 4 a.m. when pre market opened. It was $47 a share. So I yeah. sold it all 30% <laughs> while I slept. Damn, so, like, I'll look, I'll look, or GameStop. If you guys know, like, the mean stock GameStop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I did a couple of YouTube videos on Ga GameStop on margin, which is stupid because you, margin, you can get screwed. But, like, if you're really quick and smart with it. So, what I did is I took out a bunch of margin. So, margin is borrowing against your money. So, you don't have to go through personal financial statement, you just click a button and the, the brokerage knows because they have your investing history and they also know that if you don't make your margin payment, they just take your investments you from your account. Yeah. 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 So you're borrowing against your own money. So what I did with that was I, I took out a, a, a margin loan, pretty high one, and I bought a bunch of Jeppy and JEPQ, which are uh, really high uh, uh, dividend stocks. And I bought them the day before their ex-dividend date. And so, which is still risky because if you buy fifty thousand dollars in a stock and it goes down two percent, you like you, it's, you lost a lot of money. I got lucky in that they both went up like one and a half percent that day, and 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 the dividend was the next day, which was ten percent. And nice. so I, and so after the next dividend, I sold all those, and then I took that money plus another margin, and that was in the Roaring Kitty. He's, if you guys know, he's the guy who made a yeah. billion dollars of us. So I knew the stock was going to explode, and so I bought a bunch of that. And then right when the when the price, so I buy really deep in the money calls. If you get options trading, if you ever learned that, if the stock's trading about twenty dollars a share. What I look for is I'll buy like calls for ten, where I'm paying a, a, a premium to potentially buy the shares at ten dollars a share. Mm -hmm. But if I can buy that premium for nine dollars a share and the stock's twenty dollars a share, it means I'm basically paying nineteen dollars a share. 
You never get to do that except for stocks that idiots are trading in, <laughs> which are the meme stocks. And so what, what you do is you wait because those people, will they're, they're investing in margin and they'll get threatened with a margin call. And so they have to generate capital. So they'll sell deep in the money calls for a high premium to generate capital and they panic. And so they won't put a limit order and they'll just do an open order, a market order. And so I'll buy way below the, the current trading price and it'll just sit there and nine out of 10 times it never hits. But one out of 10 times some guy panic sells and I get to buy his call option for cheaper than the share is, which then the next, cause you can't, you can't, um, uh, exercise options the same day, but the next day I'll exercise. So the stock's trading at $20 a share and I got it for 19. I buy those then for $19 and then I immediately sell a call again for like $22 a share, where if the price does go up, worst case scenario is I get to sell for profit. If it doesn't go up, I keep that premium for selling. And I did a whole yeah. video on YouTube and it's a real, like they, the, it's a kind of the, the YouTube, or two, I did two videos, but it's kind of a misnomer because those like those opportunities come up rare like the trump one and the GameStop one is the only real ones that have been for like three years but mm -hmm. like when they do pop up that's where like that's what like activist investors will do they'll uh, like kyle I carl icon does that and he'll wait till like like when netflix plummeted or, or meta facebook plummeted and they'll just sit there and they'll wait for these like black swan events where facebook was down like 72 percent you know, is Facebook going over, under? No, they own Facebook, they own Instagram. They're not going under. But retail investors are down 72%. They're in full-blown panic. So they're selling and selling. It's called capitulation where the stock really, really starts to plummet. And they just wait for that, that bottom and they just buy in big because they know Facebook's huh. not going anywhere. Well, and so you always prey on like retail investors' panics. Have you seen um, Elon Musk play on Disney right now? No, what's he doing? Well, so he's he's funding um, Gina, you know the woman Carrera, that, that yeah Carrera yeah that they, 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 they fired her because of her conservative stances. So he's funding her lawsuit because Disney just hopes big companies hope that they're going to bleed you dry, right? Like you don't have the kind of money to go up against mm -hmm. our lawyers. But we'll drag it out for years and years. And Elon Musk is like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, so Elon Musk is like, oh, no, no, I'm going to fund this thing to the end because he knows that Disney's going to have to disclose a lot of horrible business practices and it's going to cause their stock to plummet. And then when that happens, he's going to swoop in and, and lowball the offer and mm -hmm. he's probably going to have enough to buy them. But I also got another question. Are, are you so close with Dante? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't talk to him much anymore. But yeah, I, Dante's interesting because we started off on the absolute wrong foot because of miscommunication. But yeah, I'm, I'm still close with him. Well, did it, speaking of investing, did he get you into the bot trading with the uh, crypto? No, no, okay. no. But I, I, I was in physics program uh, when when all the physics nerds were really into crypto. So I've been buying Bitcoin since it was under. I think fifteen hundred was my earliest, and like three thousand was a lot of my purchases. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. He got me into the bot trading with uh, the, the cryptocurrencies where you, you know, you design all these bots to, to buy and sell and you might mm -hmm. have, you know, 16 transactions a day or you might have 300, right? Because you set these, these parameters mm -hmm. and it's almost like a fail safe. Like there, there's really no way to lose unless, well, unless something like FTX.us happens yeah. where like, which is the one I had to be invested in because we're, I was living in Vermont at the time and we couldn't use Binance or any of the other exchanges for some reason. We oh, were yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had, I had put an initial $10,000 investment and within like, I want to say five or six months, it was up to like 18 K and I'm just like, Holy shit, I, I'm going to, I'm going to start sinking some real money into this and see where this goes. Cause that's what he was doing. He was having some record returns. And then next thing, you know, FTX.us goes under my accounts closed. All my money's gone right now. We're, we're in litigation to try to figure out, you know, what I'm going to get back. But mm -hmm. I didn't know if he had gotten uh, influence you in any of that because it was like print money for a minute there. Yeah, but no, but that's that's the interesting you say that because the algorithms, the algos, and so quants run those. And I, the, most quants were physicists or mathematicians. And so when yep. I actually got out of grad school, I looked into being a quant. And you just and that's what you do. You just write computer programs and algorithms. You basically take a phase space. So like w when we do things like you do like time and position, you know, like you do the kinematic equations in physics. Well, you don't have to do like position on the X set or, you know, and you don't have to do time position. You can do anything. You can do the price of oranges and how many car accidents there are and you build a face face out. And so every there's, there's no real price discovery anymore, which is, that's why I say I don't trade individual stocks other than waiting for those like 
those like once in a life rare mo- yeah because etfs are the only thing that you can really trust because those are basically the global stock market but all like individual stocks now are so driven by algorithms and you can exploit that sometimes because like gamestop that's what they're trying to do you got the short sellers running algos they're trying to do like ladder ladder uh, drives to push the price down and then you got all the reddit bros trying to buy you know and so you got you can find some predictability there but for most stocks it's like I mean, you can even see, like, pick any retail stock that, like, a, a brick and mortar retail company. Like, no one thinks, coal, no one would be surprised if coals go under, you know? It's like, yeah. ah, no one, no one. Well, that doesn't mean the company's not doing well, but yeah. people, but, but algos know that. And algos know that, like, if you're an investor and you see the price start going down, you'd be like, oh, yeah, brick and mortar, no one. And so you'll sell and they can short sell the hell out of it, you know? And yeah, so I think they're going to have to do something about bots and algo trading at some point because yeah. it's like humans aren't doing anything anymore. It's all just like these algorithms yeah. just running, you know, thousands of trades a second. So this is like a financial show now, huh? All of a sudden it, it became <laughs> that way, didn't it? Yeah, I, I learned some stuff because I'm trying to get more into investing. I have a few things that I've done, but I I want to get more involved. So I, I think I picked up a few few things here, too. I love this freaking idea of uh, storage storage places i i you do know guys who've them, done car washes they, they, and they've done really well stuck. with them i've known a guy job i've known a guy who's uh gotten loans to get them built like the new style car washes he's a friend of mine from high school and Eagle he'll go one. in yeah uh i don't know like the the the, the, the new membership style yeah. Car yeah, washes. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 and they'll they'll get the they'll get the funding to get one built he doesn't pay anything he just takes he gets loans for this and then they yeah. build it and then boom they sell it and then he moves on to the next one and uh yeah he's... we closed our car wash because we're those fuckers yeah <laughs> <laughs> man but still like even that though we we'll sit on the property we're right on uh uh, we're right on uh, 43, you know, right right on ma- the main road in Kalamazoo. We got prime commercial grape, you know, commercial mark property. It's just parking lot right now. But we'll sit on that. It, like, that's the thing, like, with you learn, like, with investing and stuff, especially in real estate, is, like, nothing has to be a loss. Our mm. storage units pay the – our storage units generate enough income to pay the mortgage for both. Yeah. And so at some point that that – parking lot is going to be a property that someone wants to build a store on you know yeah. so i'll just sit, sit on it till then you know but then it's a waiting game it might be 10 years before i'm in, above water on it but yeah. it's you know like it's you're only you are you know you only lose if you sell you know that's like, that's the thing with the stock market where i if you most i think morgan stanley or uh, i can't remember one of the places went through and they looked at all their top investors and it turned out that uh, all their top returning investment accounts were dead people because they like they didn't have it. They didn't do a will or something. So no one knew the account existed. Wow. And so they, they because, yeah, like people who trade don't make money if you buy and just let it sit there. And so they like it was an interesting thing where, where like all their best uh, individual retail accounts were by dead people because they weren't dumb enough they were to trade because they were dead. They were trading. Yeah. No action. <laughs> Aren't the um, um, storage units? I, I remember reading this because I was looking into them like eight years ago. Is it wasn't it like the fastest developing real estate um, commodity like in the nation? I think five, ten years ago. Like yeah, I well, think like- about it. Think how much crap people have. No one used to we, yeah. like we we complain about the economy and stuff, but like how much stuff did your grandma and grandpa have? You know, yep. what one car, one TV, how much yep. crap that everyone has stuff. And then people get attached to things. The shit we find in our story, like when someone doesn't pay and we have to auction one off, it's all every storage unit is the same. 17 garbage bags filled with old clothes that'll never get used. One yep. sandal where like the, the toe piece is ripped <laughs> off, like a, a kid's dresser from the 80s with garbage pail kids stickers on it and a deflated football. They're all the yep. same, like <laughs> absolutely no gold bars. Like people. <laughs> yeah, these people won't throw them away. Like it's they're all yeah. junk. Yeah. And they'll pay you 150 bucks a month to hold on to that shit. Or we have crazy. people, we have someone that's been paying since we, we didn't own it then, but since 1997. <laughs> and like who know, you know, I mean just they, they know never go there. You know, they never they don't even live in the area. Mm-hmm. No. But yeah, I mean, there's just it doesn't take that many hoarders. If one in every thousand people is some level of a hoarder, that's enough to fund almost an infinite number of storage units. Oh, you I guys, like I got hoarders like... that live next to me, next door. I, like all of our houses here on our street are nice, except for this one house, right? Yeah, they just pile their shit up on the lawn. Dude, so we like, had one of those. Dude, down, I'll tell back, you about it. 
Yeah, the back lawn has this huge pile. It looks like a burn pit of stuff that just hasn't been burned yet. And then yeah. the front lawn, there's another equal one that's like a 20 by 20 mountain of shit. And it's like, it sits there. And we live in Florida, right? It it rained for, what, like six, six days straight? Like we had a monsoon or whatever last week, hurricane. And yeah. this stuff just gets downpoured on. And it's like, what are you people doing? That's nuts, dude. We had a neighbor like that a couple blocks over and we walked the dogs and you know, go by the house. So the first time I, I walked by there, I was like, oh, are these people that I'm at a garage sale? Because I see yeah. like a, a broken mini bike and like things lining their driveway. It's, it's so a, weird the, that people the, like they get a neighborhood. To those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the only it, neighbor or the only house in the neighborhood. And then I guess they were renting or something because all of a sudden there was a condemned sign on the doors, uh, all these stickers and they leave. And, you know, those big the big dumpsters, the, the big yeah. long dumpsters, they had dropped one off filled the entire thing and then it goes the next day we see another dumpster there filled the entire thing filled the there's like seven of these dumpsters to just to download that house it was crazy. insane yeah, yeah that's crazy but um i'm trying to think of something bodybuilding related to bring it back <laughs> that's all right i, I, like I don't know about- well i got one i don't know if i can even say it but uh uh, uh, sounds like I'll be I'll be filming uh, with Generation Iron, so we You're got kidding. really lucky. No, yeah, the they uh, they must have been brainstorming. I mean, talk about luck. Uh, I made a post on Instagram talking about a rebranding of the supplement company, and I think they were like brainstorming ideas for the next docu series right when I made that post, and they reached out to me, oh, and shit. so yeah, so we want they want us to do a thing about entrepreneurship and uh, bodybuilding coaching. Uh, and then also like because the like our summit company is interesting in that it's fully self-funded you know mm-hmm. outside investors it's and by self-funding i mean me it's been even with other partners it's been me dumping money into it and so they're going to try to do a story about this like why would anyone be so stupid to try to compete with redcon one and hmm. <laughs> companies yeah. like that <laughs> but uh yeah so we'll start the uh we'll, we'll start this month actually and it'll be filming into february so i don't know what'll come of it but uh yeah, and they That's might cool. after they hear this, they might say, "Screw you! You're not supposed to talk about it." But I'm too pumped to keep quiet. Yeah, yeah, that's freaking awesome, man. I, I feel like these are great topics, especially for coaches in the industry, because coaches, they get into it and they start making a good amount of money. But then you see some guys that start to buy like nice cars or they just buy stuff, mm-hmm. right? Without yeah. the thought of like, hey, man, what if I lost all my clients tomorrow and I'm not in this industry anymore and I got to go back to being a working stiff? Yeah, Whereas, you, that's like, a, coaching is it's unique in that it's all here you can't yeah. outsource it so yeah. you're, you're limited there's some really strong constraints is a how much can you charge and b how many hours a day do you want to sit at a computer yep. and, it's, and it's how very, many years can you do it and yeah. remain relevant yeah, yeah. it's very like high have, income yeah. but there's no it's a very hard ceiling limited by your desire to work like an animal and yeah yeah Yeah. i mean i always think like what happened some of these guys if they got like a traumatic brain injury and they can no longer use their brain the same to to coach people you know oh yeah Um, so so i think like this will probably not hold them back (laughs) 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 might not notice it was good that was good but i know it's crossed my mind now because i'm you know i'll be i'm 54 um so that's you know it's I had someone very well respected in the industry years ago, uh, kind of laughingly, and he didn't mean it, you know, crappy, but he laughed, laughed and told me, you know, how, how long do you think you can do this? You're not going to be able to, to do this when you're 50 years old, Skip. <laughs> so part of me laughs and goes, well, thankfully you were wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does, since I've been in my 50s, it does weigh on my brain a little bit because, you know, even now when we're talking about potentially moving to Milwaukee to be near the kids or down here, you know, buying a home when the market turns around, I have to take into consideration things I've never had to take into consideration before. When is my life insurance run out? Mm -hmm. You know, my life insurance policy, things that I just go, Oh, I have to think about this when I'm, Buying our yeah. next house. I've never had to think about these. Things. I think the other thing people don't like really appreciate with coaching is how much of it. It's a there's zero. You never ever ever get a day off ever. Right. I mean, yeah. it's seven days a week, and even more yep. so. Like weekends are your busiest, and then yeah. from like, oh, yeah. like from like April through like September with like the main content. You have the all the the qualifying shows, and then the national qualifiers. It's you know, you don't, when you take a vacation, you might take a vacation and your family might enjoy the vacation, but your clients yeah. are still checking in. And you mm-hmm. might say, I'm on vacation, please don't check in. But all that means is that the, the, 
the jerk, the asshole clients still check in and your good clients just get shafted, you know, they yeah, respect, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, and every, you know, every, like you got shows. So it used to be shows were on Saturday. Now you got UK shows are on Sunday. Some US yeah. shows are on Sunday. You got shows on Saturday. The national shows are Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And the yeah. UK shows are on Monday. Well, the, ne- next week we got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. Right, yeah. With North yeah. Americans. Yeah. And then, and people don't realize like, they, if you're a good coach, every client thinks they're your only client. And that's, that's great right. if you're good, you know, but they don't think anything of texting you at, at one in the morning or two or three in the morning with, or if you have a UK guy, they're five hours ahead of the East coast. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so you got to be up at 1 AM. That's, you know, oh, yeah. to, they got show day. You can't just yeah. abandon them. Yeah. And like people don't realize, and that get, that's like, you can love it. And I love coaching, but it's, it's, you never get a break. You know, yeah, I think I always like the new guys who say how great it. Oh, it's just the most. It's like give it time. Not that it's get a few more clients too. Doesn't suck, but but, give it time and let the novelty wear off, and you'll see it more for the obligation and the responsibility and the Mm -hmm. business that it is. Yeah. versus this, you know, thing that you're going to Starbucks and you can have your little coffee and work on your laptop. And it's yeah. <laughs> and it's I, did, I did that my first year, Skip. I went to Starbucks or whatever. Uh, and I was like, this sure. is nice, you know, this yeah. is fun. But you're, and you're one very bitter client away from losing your business, you know? That's right. And so yeah. you, if you don't get up at 1 a.m. when you, and you got a UK client panicking the morning of the show and things oh, are yeah. falling apart and he's texting 7 a.m. his time, you know, yeah. it's like, why would my coach, it's show day. Obviously yeah. 7 a.m. I should be able to text them. Well, it's 2 a.m. your time if you're on the East Coast. It's 1 a.m. Yeah. if you're Central, you know. And so if you don't have an alarm set for those panic texts, that, that's you, that's it. You lose your UK clientele, you know. I yeah. had a couple guys when we went to Australia. They were U.S., they're Eastern Standard Time, but yeah, Australia. So I'm doing mm-hmm. the, and then we traveled around Australia where the time zone changed a little bit here yeah. and there, yeah. you know, so you're doing the math and yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. that was I the hardest, I, had, I think. My hardest one was I had a guy in South Korea, a guy in Thailand, and then <sighs> three guys in the U.S. in all of our time zones. On yeah. the same. They, so I, I just committed to staying up for like 36 hours. It was, yeah, it was and they, they don't, they, like... They just like, hey, coach, what do I do now? It's like, oh my God, what day is it for you? And when yeah, is your yeah. show? I got, yeah, I got no, one 100%. guy competing today, one guy competing tomorrow, one guy competing tomorrow, his time, which is today, my time, you know? And it's like, yep. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then, like, they might send you text, like, I feel like you don't, you're not really under, you're not really in tune with my my plan or my, and you're like, bro, I'm trying to, like, literally keep you guys all straight. So if it takes yeah, it's me 3 15 in the a.m. and I'm <laughs> texting you. Yeah. Yeah. If I respond with who this, don't get mad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know what? That that my wife makes fun of me because, like, my best friend for you know for thirty years will text me, "Hey, what's your address?" And I'll I'll type Justin Harris one five seven three nine. She's like, "You don't have to say his name." And I'm like, "I my name." I'm like, "I know," but I, it's That's... like a thing now because clients leave that stuff out. They think, oh, you know, me like, too. Yeah, yeah. And they so I just thing. I just make sure every information they could ever need is always given in every case because yep. it's, it's so easy hard. to then they can just copy paste it. It's yeah. all there. But because you know? guys will do that, they'll say like, you know, hey coach, uh, what do you think about that uh, that sodium question? And it's like, oh my god, it's three in the morning. I know you got a show in the you're like your show's in two hours. I'm brain dead, half asleep. What sodium? What platform did you text it? Is it on the app? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> could you just tell me the sodium question so I can answer it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Then you feel bad about asking that, right? Because you're like, oh, they're going to think that I'm not in tune with what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Um, There's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of pluses and minuses with this lifestyle. It's definitely a unique lifestyle. You know, 20 years ago, when I first saw, like, Skip coaching people on intense muscle, I'm like, man, that's a cool novel thing. Like, and I never imagined at the time that I'd be doing it, you know, full time a couple years later. But it, it's, it's definitely evolved. It's definitely a fun, lucrative lifestyle. It's exciting, to say the least, you know. Um, I, I will say it beats a day job, you know. Oh, in my God, opinion. Yeah. oh sure, Obviously, yeah. Obviously, we're all doing it because it beats a day job, and mm-hmm. we've all done day jobs in the past. But, but yeah, no, it's it's cool. The other thing I think people don't realize too is like you do get emotionally invested. You want your clients to win. Oh yeah, but there's only there's only one overall winner at <laughs> yeah. every show. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So you have so many more clients that you nail everything, and they couldn't have peaked better, mm-hmm. and they walk away show upset they might have even won their class but they you yeah. know and even worse you might have three people in the same contest and they all nail it but only at best only one of them is walking away happy mm, two of yeah. your three clients are upset and angry and why what happened what do you think happened coach and it's like 
you know, so it's like, it's very rare that you get to end a Saturday feeling great. It's almost <laughs> always, <laughs> you know, he works so hard. I thought we nailed it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. It's but funny I think- because you, you, that investment, I've had, it's been said to me, not, not frequently, but enough that it bothers me to question my investment in that client. And it's mm-hmm. like, Oh, this is my brand. Like, yeah. I have for over 20 years, I've been building my name and my reputation, mm-hmm. my brand. Please, I, part of me just wants to say, don't ever say something yeah. like it might mean mm-hmm. more to me than it yeah. does you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you it's getting cool. up? Are you getting up three times a night, three days in a row? You know, like, yes, on your contest, but I'm doing that every week because of my clients, you know, and yep. you don't, it, yeah, that's, yeah, it, that it's hurts kind of- too. Me, me and Nate uh, Spear were talking about, we're, he's my training partner and one of my clients, and we were talking about this yesterday, um, about how, like, how in the moment it's so annoying to us, or it kind of, like, almost hurts us, when, you're like, you know you brought this athlete in the best they've ever looked, right? And they got, like, third or fourth in their class, and maybe a national show or something like that, and they asked those questions, like, what do you think happened? And, like, you wanted to be like, look, dude, like, we did our best, you looked amazing, you're the best you could look that day, the other guys are just better. Like, yeah. like I can easily say that. Like, these guys, structurally, they're just better than you, they were drier, like, something worked for them that day. And they're like, then, they, but, so they they acknowledge every day looking up to the show that's the best they've ever looked, they're so confident, they feel good, and then the minute they get off stage, they're like, what happened? Or, yeah, I think we missed my peak. Or, yeah. and it's like, whoa, 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 man, 20 minutes ago, before you got on stage, you were so pumped up, it's just some other guy that was a little bit better showed up. Like, why are we gonna put that damper on us and maybe ruin a relationship because yeah. of the because that hurts because you like i mean it hurts it, i mean the amount of work like because i have my guys you know like start, like the, the, the final two days they're texting photos every meal you know Same. so you can't do it you're like you go you like we moved my daughter into uh to michigan state for freshman year you know like i want to i would love to just spend those eight hours moving her in but you know it's you, like if it's a yeah. Friday, you don't, you know, you don't have a, you're like, you're on a roller coaster, you know, like, you know, at an amusement park you, or your kid's birthday party, you know, and like you're giving, mm-hmm. you really, and obviously the client's giving their all too. So it's not like it's, you know, but yeah. th- th- those do hurt when they say that. Cause it's like, ah, oh, man, I was, I haven't slept in three days, you know? Yeah. yeah. It just definitely puts a damper on what was, it should have been a successful season. Like, so mm-hmm. you didn't get your program or you didn't win the overall at the show but like we brought something special that you never brought before you leveled up this year like why mm-hmm. can't we focus on the positives yeah. here you know uh for sure and eventually they do typically when they get the yeah. freedom them and they brought yeah. they're able to process the situation but at that moment i tell you i'm gonna be honest and this is i hope this is taken the right way the way that i intend <clears throat> it is far worse to be at the show when it doesn't oh, go well, because yeah. then you're literally like, fuck me. You got to yeah. be kidding me. And yeah. then you, you're, you yeah, know, it's not like it's better because you can walk away after you respond to a yeah. text or on a call, but you're not there like yeah. together. You don't have to deal with the attitude. You don't yeah, have to deal with it's the. Just, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost kind of an awkward thing because you do your, you know, you have the, the conversation and you discuss how everything went and then from there it's just kind of awkward because it's like well you're not happy you're not you know in a good mood you haven't had time to process this you need food uh, you're even to- even worse yeah. if it's a saturday it's like i'm sorry but my uk guy's calling right now yeah, yeah, exactly. he's, he's competing in the morning <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah, the family it, that's is the looking part. at you like oh man are you really are you good at what you do because yeah oh my yeah son, my son yeah. looked like you should have smoked everybody and yeah what'd you do that. wrong yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's an interesting sport where like your whole career feels like it's on the line with every client every every weekend, every weekend. (laughs) (laughs) And then you get to like like maybe you have like two bad weekends in a row in a sense, and you're like, well, I guess I guess I'm done. I guess I'm gonna have to get a real job. Oh god! Or when you have a guy who takes second at a pro qualifier multiple (laughs) times, and it's like. God, could you just, oh, this sucks yeah. so bad. Cause you know, then you're like, am I getting a reputation as the guy who brings in guys second? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No one That's wants right. to be second. Yeah. I got to go though. I, I just forgot. We were supposed to have dinner with my daughter and her boyfriend at 630. Oh, <laughs> so, well, hit it, hit it then guys. But, we appreciate everybody tuning you, in. Yeah. We appreciate everybody hanging with us. Yeah, this is and, awesome. Justin, what, uh, where do people go if they want to, you mentioned your supplement earlier. How do they, uh, how do they find your stuff? 
Uh, well, you just search Troponin, which is the worst business name ever. Heart attack nutrition, but <laughs> Troponin Nutrition. <laughs> It did cross tell this, my mind. It I'll tell cross, the story real quick. Like, I wonder if he so, regrets that. Oh my god! Well, so yeah, like 25 years ago, I'm on the internet, and I, so troponin binds to tropomyosin. <clears throat> when calcium goes in a muscle cell, it binds to troponin, which moves troponin off tropomyosin to allow a muscle to contract. And so, on different muscle, on different forums, I would either be troponin or tropomyosin. Well, on intense muscle and muscle mayhem, I was troponin, and so those are the ones I was most known for. And so. Like I started coaching people, and I was like, I should start a website. Everyone knows me as Troponin. I didn't think anyone. I didn't think I'd be a business. I certainly didn't think 25 years later I'd have yeah. multiple websites. But now I'm stuck with heart attack because Troponin's also a cardiac marker for a heart attack. <laughs> but the good thing is go not to, a lot of people know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and not a lot of yeah people. Not a lot of people we're working with are, are, are cardiac <laughs> rehab patients. But uh, right. yeah, go to Troponin <laughs> supplements or Troponin Nutrition. Both of them have our supplements. Troponin Nutrition has all the coaching. We have ebooks, clothing. Uh, blood work analysis. My wife specializes in sleep dentistry. If you think you have sleep apnea and you don't want to go through the nine month process, you can sign up and you can get same day consultation uh, for referral for for, for sleep uh, appliance. No kidding. Uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, yeah. I need to be better about marketing it because it's it's a lifesaver. Because you think you have sleep apnea, you go to see your doctor. You got to wait three weeks. You get into them, they'll refer you to to a sleep specialist six months later. Then they'll refer you to sleep study in six months. With with us, you sign up, and that day you'll have a referral for your sleep study. Nice, that's cool. That's cool. I didn't know that. Uh, anyway, guys, but you know, check out everything with Justin. Go to uh, bodyberry.com to reach out to Andrew and teamskip.com to reach out to Skip. You can hit me up, McNallyDiets at gmail.com. And of course, check out truenutrition.com. Use our code, think over there, supplementsource.ca for Canadians. Thank you to all of our Patreons. Thank you to everybody hanging out in the live stream. And uh, of course, if you're new to our content, then we'd love to have you along for future shows. Of course, hit the subscribe button and all that. You guys know what to do. All right, for another episode of Blood, Sweat, and Gear, guys, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.